Hello, I'm Ken Watkins. I'm the Associate Pastor, University Baptist Church, Columbus, Ohio. I want to add my greeting uh, to the greetings of others um, as we begin this virtual service today. Uh, I'm always looking for metaphors. I love metaphors, and I'm always looking for metaphors to describe our church. And one of the metaphors that comes to mind is that we are our mission outpost. We are a, a a, a, a witness to a, to an area of the world. Uh, in fact, a, a whole world is just across the street from us in uh, with Ohio State University. Uh, we we are also in the, the capital city of uh, of, of Ohio, uh, which is a which is a, a very populated state, and um, and so we have a responsibility. Uh, as an outpost to, to, to live out the gospel to, uh, and to reclaim the gospel. <clears throat> but we're also a full-service church. We're a church that uh, sees all kinds of things, uh, all the kinds of things that, that are part of life. Uh, we, uh, we, have, we, we baptize people. Uh, we have babies to come. And, um, and, we, and we grieve with those who are, are grieving. Uh, the, and... Uh, uh, and walk with those who, who are in as they face the uh, challenges of life. But another, I think another metaphor for the church is that we're really a spiritual garden. Now I'm standing in the, at, uh, what some people call the Peace Garden, some people call Memorial Garden, it's in the back of the church. And um, uh, it's, a, it's pretty lush right now because of all the rain we've had and there's just lots of flowers growing up together. Um, I'm uh, I'm the, these, uh, I, the, I chose this spot because the white, the white flowers are so vivid, uh, and um, uh, we uh, we have people come in to our church. All of us come in, and we're we're like seeds, and, and in many cases we don't know what kind of seeds we are. We don't know what we're going to develop into, but the University Baptist Church provides the nurture for for, for people to grow. And many people have been a part of University Baptist Church for uh, for decades. But also some people come, st primarily students, a lot of students come and are with us for a while. And uh, and so we we, uh, we help them to grow. And then they go someplace else and they plant themselves. And they continue to grow and to become the, uh, the, um, the flower, become the, the plant, become the person that God uh, wants them to become. So we're glad you're worshiping with us today. And uh, we invite you uh, on July 4th, we will be worshiping in person. I invite you to come and uh, be a part of that, that, uh, that Independence Day celebration of a time when we break, uh, uh, officially break loose and, uh, and, and begin our, our life together again uh, in, in person ways. Amen. Please join us for the opening prayer. Mighty God, to you belong the mysteries of the universe. You transform shepherds into kings, the smallest seeds into magnificent trees, and hardened hearts into loving ones. Bless us with your life-giving spirit. Recreate us in your image. And shape us to your purposes. Through Jesus Christ. Amen. And now join us for the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Hi, everyone. Our scripture reading for this morning is Mark chapter 4, verses 26 through 34. He also said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, 
the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it, as the harvest has come. Again, he said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like, or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants, with such big branches that the birds can perch in shade. With many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as much as they could understand. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. But when he was alone with his own disciples, he explained everything. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. What shall we say God realm is like? What parable can tell? Eternal truth in simple words and illustrate it well. God realm is like a mustard seed, the small Good morning, University Baptist Church. It's nice to be back with you this Sunday. It's been an honor to make these videos for you this year during COVID and to make this video as well. This third to last sermon video before you return to worship in person July 4th. Earlier this year, I talked to you about chaos and I talked about how God uses chaos to create a world of novelty, a world that breaks up old patterns and discloses new possibilities. So as you prepare to return to worshiping in person, I want to offer one last challenge to you because I think when you get back, it'll be hard to contain the excitement. Things will feel new, but I think you'll find that it's very easy to return to the routine. So I want to challenge you to prepare for a God who shows up in unexpected places and in unexpected ways. To get at this point, I want to recall the scripture you just had read in Mark 4, the parable of the mustard seed. There is another place where this parable crops up, and it's in Luke 13. The passage is shorter there than in the Mark passage, and it reads as follows. He said, therefore, what is the kingdom of God like, and to what should I compare it? It is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in the garden. It grew and became a tree, and the birds of the air made nests in its branches. Now, scholars are divided with respect to the dates of these parables. Some believe Mark is the earliest uh, recorded version. Others believe Jesus told the parable over and over, and that every version is equally authentic and, and equally original. Some believe that the source scholars call Q is the earliest, and that this Luke passage was taken from that source. 
The Luke passage is also very similar to the version of the parable found in the non-canonical Gospel of Thomas. And for that reason, some scholars argue that the Luke version is probably the version most similar to the version the historical Jesus actually told. To see this, note that in the Luke passage, unlike the Mark passage, there is no reference to size of the mustard seed and to the size of the plant that it grows into. For some scholars, this changes the meaning of the parable. I personally am incredulous. And one reason for incredulity is that the Luke passage contains an implicit reference to size simply by contrasting the seed with the plant into which it grows. What do scholars who prize this Luke passage think the parable means? Well, for these scholars, the parable suggests that Jesus viewed the kingdom as a present reality. So what would a mustard seed mean in a present reality? Well, it's true that the mustard seed, even at that time, the time of historical Jesus, was seen as was known for its proverbial smallness. However, it was also known for producing mustard bushes, which were actually not trees, and they were known to spread like weeds. So the mustard plant could be used for medicinal purposes in, at that time, but because it spread aggressively, it was also considered dangerous. So why would Jesus refer to that particular plant? Well, according to some scholars, Jesus was commenting on the political arrangement of his time. At that time, the Roman Empire was an advanced agrarian society, and control over the land, its yield, its distribution, its cultivation, was exercised by extracting taxes, tribute, rents. To the laborers Jesus often spoke to, this was a considerably exploited practice. In fact, the peasant laborers were subjected to several rounds of taxes, some that went to the Romans in the form of tributes, um, and others that, were, that went to local authorities. However, those tributes were taken after harvest surplus was removed. So the tributes were, sub were subtracted from the subsistence harvest that the, peasants, the peasant laborers were left with. So what Jesus is doing, according to some scholars, with this parable is drawing attention to the situation. The kingdom of God has culinary and medicinal properties, like the mustard bush was known for, but it also had subverted properties because it spread like a weed. So what Jesus is saying, according to some scholars here in this parable, is that the kingdom of God is taking over the Roman kingdom. It's, it's taking over the empire of the day. And birds come and, 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 and nest in its branches. Well, what does that mean? Well, when birds come and nest in branches, they eat the food that is in the plant. So the birds are taking from the harvest that the Romans own. And in that sense, they reduce the surplus harvest and eat into Rome's taxation base. So according to these scholars, the parable of the mustard seed tells of a kingdom free of exploitation. But it also serves another function, because at that time, there were the, uh, the peasant laborers were not just subjected to the rule of the Romans, but also the rule of the temple. And in the temple, holiness meant order. And there were temple purity laws, right? So mixing things that were, that were not alike meant chaos and pollution. And so by suggesting that the kingdom is like a mustard seed of mustard bush planted in a garden, Jesus is suggesting that God's kingdom is actually undermining purity laws. By suggesting that God's kingdom is like an invasive plant, Jesus is suggesting that the kingdom is taking over the kingdom of the temple. So the mustard parable is a subversive parable that subverts both the empire of Rome and the hegemony of the temple. Now, with this story, we see that the scholars who would like to strongly contrast the Mark and, and Luke passages have very much offered us a vacuous contrast, right? We're supposed to be shifting from an emphasis on the size of the mustard seed, the size of the plant that grows from it, right? And then shifting to this kind of socio-political situation. And, and I don't want to deny that, that is, uh, that's, what, that's what's happening here, that Jesus is commenting on that situation. What I want to point out is just that 
by talking about the mustard seed and, and talking about it turning into a bush, you have that implicit contrast between something that's very small and something that's very large. So this kind of contrast between social scientific readings and allegorical readings is, is very much kind of overstated, right? What we have really here is an overzealous academic debate with pretty low stakes, right? It's, it's hard for me personally to imagine that the parable has significantly changed meaning, but of course, I'm not here to talk to you about scholarly hyperbole. What I do want to point out is just how much this parable in both Mark and Luke points to the unexpected. God's kingdom brings the unexpected. This is a theme throughout scripture and throughout Christ's teaching. Consider the parable of the Good Samaritan. We all know that parable. Man's traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. He's attacked by robbers. A priest and a Levite pass by, offer no assistance. And then a Samaritan appears and takes pity on him. So what's going on in that story? Well, I want to share with you a commentary that was recently offered by Robert Stewart in a, in a book called What Did the Cross Accomplish? Robert Stewart, if you don't know him, he's a professor of philosophy and theology at New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. I, I want to quote him at length. This is what he says. He says, this parable is Jesus' response to the question, who is my neighbor? Luke tells his readers the man's question was insincere. He was trying to justify himself, not gain information. My experience over the years, Stuart writes, has been that this parable is generally preached in American churches either as a moral story along the lines of what we would hear from Fred Rogers in Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, or as an example of the dangers of legalism. But it's not really either. Bear in mind that Jesus' audience was composed of first century Jews. As such, they had certain worldview expectations about how the story would run and the plot moves it would make. To their ears, this was a shockingly subversive story. Jesus surprises them. Their expectation is that the priest and the Levite will help their fellow Jew, but neither one does. Then the Samaritan, whom they expect to be the villain of the story, does the right thing. Jesus' commandment, go and do the same, is not simply about how they should behave, but about whom they should not follow. I tell this story this way to my students. A new seminary student arrived in New Orleans early in the morning before the sun was up. He got lost and ran out of gas. He left his car to go get some. Unfortunately, he was robbed and beaten. A few hours later, a seminary professor passed by and thinking that the man was drunk, said to himself, some people never learn. The wages of sin is death. A little later, a seminary student passed by and would have helped him, but the student was running late and had a test that morning. So he didn't stop, but instead prayed for the man, Lord, please send someone to help him. Finally, the atheist owner of a strip club on Bourbon Street stops and helps him. Then, Stuart writes, I say to my students, that feeling of revulsion that you felt when I said atheist owner of a strip club on Bourbon Street is the same feeling Jesus' original audience felt when he said Samaritan. So God works the unexpected. This is one of the things that becomes apparent when we reflect on this parable. And as we reflect back on the parable of the mustard seed, we see something unexpected happening also. But at this point, you might be saying, brother, you know, I, I expected that. I'm a woke Baptist universalist, and baby, I was ready for it all. The end of exploitation, salvation for non-believers. I'm already on that train. But not so fast. Because if you're a sola scripture, a Baptist, you're going to have to deal with the fact that the doctrine of penal substitution is the theological currency of the Bible. And that the justification by faith the Apostle Paul preached requires the appropriation of the divine pardon that the cross purchased you. Jesus, the historical Jesus, was very likely not a universalist. 
Consider also the description of Jesus as a friend of tax collectors and sinners. What's that all about? Well, if you're someone like me and you're you're sympathetic with the democratic socialism of a person like Bernie Sanders, this passage is going to be troubling to you. Eating with tax collectors and sinners is expressing a common identity, a social solidarity with the very wealthy. It's as if Jesus was an Amazon worker striking for a living wage and he passes, he crosses the picket line. And he dines with Jeff Bezos on a yacht. Not on any yacht, on the $500 million yacht that Jeff Bezos needs another yacht for. Jesus isn't going to do what you want him to do. You know, earlier this year, I talked about divine providence. I said, it's a mistake to think that everything that happens in the world is the will of God. But I also said it's equally a mistake to suppose that everything you want to happen is God's will. Sometimes, and I can tell you this for personal, from, from personal experience, sometimes we question whether God has a plan. And maybe the reality is that we just don't like it. So what does all of this mean? Well, it seems to me that Jesus doesn't have time for good guy bad guy thinking. Yes, the Romans were exploitative. Yes, Jesus wanted to put an end to their exploitation. But no, Jesus is not going to villainize them. He's going to eat with them. Yes, Jesus knew the moral potential of the non-believer. Yes, Jesus recognized their humanity. But no, Jesus is not going to suggest everyone's already saved. He's going to die for them. But they're going to have to decide what to do with them. So what do we do with that? Or rather, what should we do with that? Well, let's start with the former question. Because what we actually do with that is we create two columns in our minds. On one side, we have everything that Jesus did. And on the other side, we have everything that Jesus didn't do. Then we ask ourselves, where do I fall? Where does everyone else fall? And we divide ourselves up. Everyone we know of. Some people fall more on one side. Others fall on the other. The good guys and the bad guys. But if we listen carefully to what Jesus is doing throughout Scripture, invariably, we see how half-hearted this actually is. Because if we're really trying to be like Jesus, we know and we should recognize that Jesus didn't do this kind of thing at all. He refused to create the columns. So who are we going to sit with? Well, it's Pride Month. Do you identify as LGBTQIA+. Are you willing to break bread with a homophobe? Are you a person of color? Are you willing to break bread with a member of the Aryan Brotherhood? Are you a woke liberal? Are you willing to break bread with Marjorie Taylor Greene? Now, hold on, right? Because I already hear the the far-left feminist critics. They're saying, well, this is all very easy for you to say. You're a buff, tatted up white man. You have privileges we don't have. You're asking us to put ourselves in harm's way. But no, I'm not. When John the baptizer was killed, Jesus withdrew. Use your judgment. I'm not asking for recklessness. What I'm challenging you to do is be merciful. How else? do we think we are going to change the world? Are we just liberal federalists? Do we just think we're going to pass some laws and force everyone to act and think exactly like us? Do we really think that's realistic? What in our experience has taught us 
or can lead us to justifiably conclude and expect that. When we look at Scripture, right, we do see the unexpected. But let's be very careful and clear about what that's going to mean and what that's going to look like. Because I'm going to put my money on mirror neurons. I'm going to put my money on empathy. I'm going to put my money on genuine human connection, on the gospel. I'm going to put my money on the bet that the world won't actually become a safer place until the threats that crop up in our very being, the fires that crop up in our very being, are going to be or can be extinguished by the tears of someone crying in front of them. Consider the cries of George Floyd. The tragic truth is that those cries changed minds. Of course, I wish it weren't so. It's beyond horrifying that it has to get that bad just to get one conviction, just to get justice one time. And let's, not, and let's be clear, that's all that it was. What I want to insist on today is that we not let it get that bad. There was once a time when the church was a place for reconciliation. There was once a time not so long ago when I was growing up when churches sought to be places where these kinds of conversations that I'm talking about, these kinds of exchanges could be had. Today, so many churches are simply cable news echo chambers. There's your woke liberal church. Over here is your staunch conservative church. Here you'll hear about inclusion preached. Here you'll hear the law. Now, I'm not saying that these churches are equivalent, that they're making the exact same mistakes, that they're both equally wrong. You guys know me. You know where I stand. What I am trying to say is that we have to have the humility to ask whether we are really standing as close to Jesus as we think we are. What does standing close, what does standing closer to Jesus look like? I don't know. I can only gesture at that. I can only read the scriptures. I can only seek and strive to hear and see what the scriptures are telling me. I can only hope to grow, hope to learn, hope to move nearer to the truth. And that is my point. Is it fair? Is any of this fair? No, not really. It wasn't even fair for Jesus who himself was a marginalized person. Remember the suffering in the Garden of Jezebel. All I can say is that when we look at the scriptures, we seem to have a theme pervading these readings, right? And it's a theme, it's an expectation, paradoxical as it may be, that to the best of our abilities, we must expect the unexpected and become agents that facilitate the emergence of the unexpected. And then that might be the only way forward. Amen.
Rejoice in the Lord always. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Lord, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for the burgeoning of summer. We thank you that we can begin again with our summer activities, festivities, and get-togethers. We remember you today because you made all things possible. Every good and perfect gift comes from you. We pray that the light you shine through us will ra radiate to our family, friends, and to all who need us. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, help us to be intentional about our relationships this summer. Let us set aside time to spend with our loved ones and mend any broken relationships that may have occurred during our absence from one another. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, we thank you for all the diversity that we encounter on a daily basis. Diversity of thought, ideas, experiences, talents, you name it. Help us to be welcoming and celebrate diversity and be intentionally inclusive, not just tolerant of differences, but always welcoming. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, we recognize that there are still those among us who cannot travel. They can't meet with others, maybe perhaps due to financial reasons or due to health reasons. Please heal all who are unwell and provide greater opportunity for those who are experiencing lack. Help us to keep our trust in you, even when life is hard. Help us to turn to you as our source, for it is you who gives us the capacity to gain wealth and healthy relationships. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, we thank you for our beautiful world. Help us to appreciate it more and not take it for granted. This world is your marvelous creation and it is good in your eyes. In this rush, rush, hurry, hurry world, help us to take time every day to spend time in your creation and sit quiet in your presence. Lord, hear our prayer. Brothers and sisters have a wonderful time enjoying God and one another this week. I love you. Have a good week. This is the offertory portion of our service. Uh, each week we take a few minutes and reflect on God's goodness to us and invite others, invite ourselves to, uh, to give to God in a variety, any, in ways that God might be calling us. Um, as I stand in our sanctuary, I'm, I'm struck with how many symbols there are for giving and sacrifice and making sacrifice for others. Uh, we have a lot of crosses in our church, but oh, behind, the, behind the baptistry is a cross, uh, behind the choir is a cross, even above us, uh, the beams form a cross, and as we go out, out into the world, there's a cross over the door. Uh, the cross is a symbol of, of, of sacrifice, it's a symbol of, su of suffering, it's a symbol of God's willingness to uh, to inv in, involve himself, God's self, in the world and, uh, and experience the suffering that we experience. On the back wall, is a, we have a, um, a quilt that was, that was made as, to auction off at, the, um, at a Gay Pride uh, Festival a few years ago. Uh, one of our members won it and, uh, and has loaned it back to the church and it's, and it's, and it's, and it's uh, on, the, on the wall. Uh, the generosity of this person uh, reminds me of, of God's call to give for us to give. Um, there's another another banner on the right, which was made by members of our church. There's also a, um, a quilted um, banner on the pulpit, which uh, it reminds us again of the of the LGBTQ community and our commitment to them, and um, even the and the um, the the <clears throat> reef above the behind the pulpit 
uh, sort of left over from, from Easter, I think. But it was it was placed here by um, either Leslie or, or Carrie, who've uh, who've throughout the pandemic have continued to keep our our sanctuary, um, uh, make it a worshipful experience, a worshipful place, even though none were coming um, to into it. Uh, on the on this wall behind the uh, the uh, the choir um, organ pipes. Um, in front of the organ pipes or it's a banner that says make a joyful noise. If I were singing, that would be exactly what it would be. Uh, but we, we're we blessed to have a great choir that, um, that when, and on Sundays they give of their gifts. Uh, they sing from over here and they give of, our, their, of, their, of their talent and, and we are all the recipients of that. If you'd like to give to the University of Baptist Church, uh, you can uh, send a check to 50 uh, UBC, 50 West Lane Avenue, Columbus, Ohio, 43201. Or you can, you can go online and uh, to the, um, uh, our website, which is ubccolumbus.org, and scroll till you get to the place where it tells you to donate. Let us pray. Oh God, you are, you are the giver of many good gifts. And, they, and the symbols of, the, of your giving to us uh, are all around us. Uh, they are most evident in the faces of your people and, uh, and in the hearts of your people. So God, we, we, we pray for your people, the, particularly the people that are part of University Baptist Church, that on this day you will, you will help us to know how to give and, and, how to, and how to celebrate your giving to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, no.